got questions, come grab me right after class. Um, other questions, comments, what's happening a week from Monday? Midterm, yes. So um, it's amazing how fast this term has gone by. Um, really kind of ridiculous. <clears throat> so speaking of tests, um, oh, wait a minute. This is the wrong question here. We've seen these ones before. Let's actually do a different one. You guys like those questions? Think those would work better? <laughs> Let's try these ones instead. That look better? No. Uh, <laughs> most of the antiviral small molecule drugs that target entry that we discussed block receptor binding by binding the receptor, receptor binding by binding the virus, fusion, conformational change, transport to the nucleus. Ten, time to guess. <laughs> okay, what do we think? Let's actually show the results. Here we go. Um, seem to be about, split about half and half between receptor binding by binding the virus and a conformational change. A um, couple of important things on here. Um, one of them was the small molecule. Um, that's because it means it's not a vaccine. And so that was the main reason that I added that there. Uh, small molecule basically is defined as something which is not a protein. And so peptides, uh, more smaller chemicals. Um, so targeting entry, um, receptor binding by binding the virus. We actually didn't talk about any of the molecules that block that. We talked about conformational changes, however. So it's the big conformational changes, uh, which is the difference. You can have conformational changes that have to do with the actual virus capsid changing, which is what you see for polioviruses, or for the fusion protein changes. Um, and so those are, so it's the conformational change, which is, is being blocked there. So let's close this one and move to our next question, which is, Bacterial adaptive viral immunity is due to restriction in the nucleases, changes in receptors, thick membranes, CRISPR, or lysis inhibition. And CRISPR is clustered regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. And again, feel free to talk about this stuff. Five. Oops, let's show the answers. Yes. Um, yeah, woohoo, CRISPRs it is. Yay. 
Uh, we'll talk much more about restriction endonucleases. Restriction endonucleases are a great way that viruses can protect themselves from virus, but it's not an adaptive process. Um, changes in receptors, again, is mutational stress, mutational pressures. We talked about this in molecular genetics just yesterday. Uh, thick membranes is probably another evolutionary way to deal with viruses and just general attack. CRISPRs, these are the spacer regions which are acquired, we're not quite sure how, from virus infections. Um, and then lysis inhibition we'll talk about uh, later on as well. So that one, I guess I explained properly or somebody else told you about it, as the case may be. So our last clicker question for today is production of the lysis protein in the single-stranded RNA bacteriophage MS2 is due to conflict between replicase and ribosome, differential secondary structures, binding the replicase protein to the genome, binding the capsid protein to the genome, or ribosome slippage. Ten. Okay, let's take a look. <clears throat> Lots of differences of opinion on this one. Um, I guess I didn't do a terribly good job of explaining it, um, just how I always sort of look at these things. Uh, Definitely, conflict between replicase and ribosome is a big problem for all RNA viruses, but it's not specifically in the case for the lysis protein. It's what you need at the very, very end. So actually, you've done basically all of your replication at that point. Um, differential secondary structures are important for practically everything in the MS2 genome except for the lysis protein. Uh, binding of the replicase protein to the genome um, is important, but that's more having to do with the coat protein rather than the lysis protein. Um, binding the capsid protein to the genome is um, probably as close to the correct answer, which is ribosome slippage, uh, but that's more having to do with shutting down the replicase protein and how the replicase protein is being made. So um, the answer is ribosome slippage. Oops, let's actually get that right so it scores you properly. I will post, oops, don't need to start that again. We don't need to do this. Let's uh, hide those results. Um, <clears throat> and move on to just finishing up with the small RNA phage. I'll quit this. We don't need that. Um, <clears throat> replication versus translation. Um, really talking about the replication, but mostly about the maturation protein, which we didn't have a chance to talk about before. Talk a little bit about some biotechnology applications using specifically the replicase proteins from these bacteriophage. And then we'll move on and talk about some single-stranded DNA bacteriophage a little bit later on. So this is the same slide that I had last time, um, having to do with replication versus translation. Um, the positive strands and negative strands, because of the really stable secondary structure, particularly in the positive strand, don't bind to each other, and so when you've made your negative strand, i.e. the non-coding strand, it's really easy for the replicase to come down and bind that and make multiple copies of it. So it's really easy to make multiple copies of your genome um, once you've made that negative strand. So the, the key is making the negative strand in the first place. Um, and again, the replicase binds to the coat protein start codon, so it's regulatory for the coat protein rather than for the lysis protein. 
we didn't really talk about is how you make that minus strand in the first place. It turns out to be really dependent on host proteins, which again is not terribly surprising. These are viruses which depend on host proteins. Very few proteins in their genome, just four coded proteins for both Q-beta and MS2. So they need host proteins. What the real surprise was, however, is that a lot of the host proteins that are involved are these translation proteins, like elongation factor TU, elongation factor TS, um, one of the ribosomal proteins, S1. And so the first is like, you know, what the heck are all these translation proteins involved in looking at RNA replication? And at first it doesn't really make sense, you know, translation versus replication. Well, one way that it makes sense is that you don't want to translate and replicate at the same time. So if you're using those proteins for replication, they're not going to be able to be using for translation. But probably much more importantly is that these are proteins that bind to RNA. And so it's that RNA binding property of all of these elongation factors for translation which are really important for getting the binding for the replicase protein in the single-stranded RNA phage to replicate their genome. There is one other protein here, um, which is also just called the host factor, and this gives you a little bit of idea of the history of how a lot of molecular biology was discovered. People were studying virus replication. They found mutants in the host that could no longer replicate. So they just called it host factor. Um, turns out, of course, it's not there. It didn't evolve to help the virus replicate. Um, it evolved for other purposes, which is a poly A binding protein. So it's a poly A binding protein that's normally present in E. coli. Um, e. coli does have poly A's. They're nowhere near as long as the ones you think about in eukaryotes. Um, but this guy um, helps really base pair to the three prime end of the virus genome. And the particular, the CCA tail. CCA tail mean anything to people? Where does that come from? Sound vaguely familiar? tRNAs. So tRNAs almost always have CCA tails at the end. And in the case of bacteria, this is coded for in the genome. In eukaryotes, there are actually often enzymes that will add that tail to the end of your tRNAs. So um, polybinding protein associated with tRNAs also needs this um, process. Turns out if you look at the way the genome replicates, it's really kind of strange. It starts with the second nucleotide, and then will replicate through to the end of the genome. And the extra one, extra nucleotide, is a RA that gets added. And if you think about a lot of the polymerases, any of you have done PCR, particularly using the TAC polymerase, one of the things it does is it adds A's at the end. Um, lots of polymerases actually will add A residues at their end. And so the virus is just taking advantage of this. You don't want to have, be continually shrinking your genome every time. And this is always a problem. You know, think about telomeres. You know, ends of genomes are a real pain to try and replicate. And so one way for dealing with that is actually starting a little bit off at the end, just taking advantage of the fact that the polymerase will actually add these A residues at the end. So start at position two and then end up at the end. And that's probably because you've got some of these other RNA binding proteins which are critical. And again, the question mark here is because we're not entirely sure um, how that's going on. So I mentioned before, huge amounts of secondary structure in your positive strand RNA, a lot less so in the negative strand. And of course, negative strand is not being translated. So you don't have the same problem of ribosomes and replicases running into each other. So it turns out you just need replicase. You've got replicase protein, negative strand, you make lots of copies of your positive strand. And so that's the only protein that you need. And this will become important when we get to the end and talk about some of the biotechnology applications for this. Um, you end up with way more of your plus strand than the negative strand. Again, it's not terribly surprising because you need all these cellular proteins in order to be making the negative strand, positive strand. Once you've made that negative strand, you can make multiple copies of it. Uh, is it protected from cellular nucleases? Again, Problems with ends are not just replicating them, but also lots of exonucleases inside the cells. It's not entirely clear um, how this is actually functioning, um, but it does seem to be protected from nucleases. Again, um, it's not entirely clear why or how that's actually happening. One more protein that we've kind of ignored, and this is kind of going you know, by the chapter. Thought about doing it another way around, but um, they have it this way as well. So I'm structuring my lecture in the same way. 
Uh, maturation protein, remember this is the one that you just need one copy of per virion, so way less than any of the other proteins. So how do you get very small amounts of this? Well, it turns out that the maturation protein is only made from brand new genome sequences. And so you have have your positive strand that gets translated, you get your coat protein, and then it starts to compete with the replicase protein. You make replicase protein, the replicase protein associates with all the cellular proteins, and then gives you a negative strand. That then gets copied again by the replicase into positive strand, and it's that new positive strand that actually allows the translation of the maturation protein. And so it makes sense. Every time you have a new genome, you're going to need one more maturation protein. It's going to be one maturation protein per capsid, one genome per capsid. How does this happen? Again, it's through alternative secondary structure. And if you remember the genome, I should have put the map back up here, but the maturation protein is right at the five prime end of the genome. It's the very beginning of the genome. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the, literally the five prime end right here of the genome. So when the genome is released inside the cell on infection, here's your five prime end. The way you can tell it's the five prime end of your genome, it's got a triphosphate at the end. Um, and that's that G residue, which may be coming from the EFTU. Um, EFTU is a GTPase, and so people think that, that maybe the G from the GTPase protein actually gets added by the replicase here. So um, triphosphate on your G extends, has this really stable secondary structure, which blocks the shine delgarno sequence and the start codon, which for this protein is a GUG rather than an AUG. So start codon uh, is never going to be used because you can't get the ribosome associated with here, just in that genome that you bring inside the cell. On the other hand, when you just made a new genome, it's going to start folding up into its secondary structure. And it turns out that there are actually two stable ways to fold up this RNA. This one is much more stable, but as you're making this new RNA, it forms this alternative secondary structure, which allows the shine delgarno sequence to be bound by the ribosome. So literally what's happening in this case, which is true, again, in most bacteria, you've got coupled transcription and translation. You're making your messenger RNA. The ribosome binds to it as it's coming off of the polymerase. Now, as this RNA is coming off of the replicase, so it's making that, copying off the minus strand, making positive strand, now you can get the ribosome bound to that and make the maturation protein. So the maturation protein is all going to be downstream of this GUG. So this is going to be the coding sequence for your maturation protein. It's all going to be downstream from that. Okay, yeah, I really should have um, put up the map of the genome here, make it a little bit easier to, to follow. But there's this, basically it's 130 nucleotides that are upstream of the translation start for the maturation protein. It's so a relatively short, and we'll see this again and again and again in other RNA viruses that there's some regulatory sequences which are at the very five prime end of the genome. Okay, so now we've made all of our proteins. How do we put stuff together and get out? Capsid protein, we already mentioned before. You get enough of it, it binds to that regulatory structure for the replicase protein. Make enough of it, then you start to form your nice T equals one particles. Uh, what's great about these viruses and also a lot of the other simple, small viruses, both of bacteria and also of eukaryotes, is you can just take capsid protein together with RNA and it will make nice particles. They're not infectious, you need the maturation protein for that, but you can make really nice particles just by putting these things together. And in fact, the crystal structure that I showed was from one of these, even in the absence of RNA. You don't even need the RNA if you've got enough capsid protein, all that fits together. The lysis protein, again, which are made by the ribosome scanning, is incredibly hydrophobic, and basically all it does is make a hole in the cell membrane. And through that hole, the virus can escape. So you've escaped. We've gone through the whole process now. Um, just wanted to mention really briefly this great thing about 
the negative strand can be made by just the replicase itself. And so one of the things that people have taken advantage of is now using this to make small, say, make large amounts of RNA. We all know about PCR, hopefully. Large amounts of DNA from templates. Well, now using the RNA replicase um, works very nicely for this. So it turns out that the sequence that the replicase binds to, particularly for that negative strand, is going to be what's at the very three prime end of your genome. And so you can just take that sequence, which is normally present at the three prime end of your genome, and pop it onto whatever piece of RNA you like, and that will replicate in just in the presence of the replicase. Um, so this is MDV1, which is just a small piece of RNA, again, which is replicated at very high amounts due to just the presence of the replicase. And the replicases are really great RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. The neat thing that you can do with this is the replicase doesn't care what's after that RNA that you start with. And so you can put in basically whatever RNA you want right next to the recognition sequence for the cubator polymerase. So what you can do is you put in a complement to whatever you're interested in trying to find here. Usually it'll be an RNA sequence that you're trying to detect. You can immobilize your target RNA. Usually this is going to be something like a viral RNA. So it's a really nice way of detecting viral RNAs. These two will bind to each other through normal hybridization. Then you wash everything away, and then you see if you can amplify whatever that sequence was. So that's actually easier to see, I think, in the cartoon form, but I thought I'd write it out as well. Here we have your MDV1 RNA up at the top there with an inserted sequence in it. Again, this is what you're trying to detect. Then you put this together with some sample that might or might not have your target RNA in it. So that you're going to have two sequences in here that you're interested in. One, which is going to match your modified MDV, and the other one is a way that you can bind to this target RNA. It could be a poly-A tail, for instance. And so now this would be a poly-T tail that you can somehow separate from everything else. You just want to make sure you've just got RNA, which is in there. You don't know what that RNA particularly is. And that's why you need the MDV RNA. If you have these that come together, you get the MDV RNA, which is still in your reaction because it's stuck to this oligo over here. You throw in replicase, you make many, many, many copies of your MDV RNA. This works reasonably well. It works a lot better if you actually now have your MDV RNA that's split in the middle. And the reason for that is you may have a little bit of false positives if you have just that RNA which you put in the MDV RNA. So the idea is you have your target RNA. If it's present in there, then you have your MDV RNA. If you don't, then when you do that wash step, which is a really critical step, all that MDV RNA is gone. If it's gone, you throw in the replicase, you're not going to amplify anything. On the other hand, if it has bound, this MDV is going to um, lead to huge amounts of production of your RNA. So it's a very sensitive detection mechanism for looking at particularly RNA-RNA interactions. You also don't need a thermal cycler for this. It turns out everything happens at 37 degrees. Um, so it's a relatively straightforward technique and an extremely sensitive technique for detecting RNAs. So some HIV assays are exactly using this particular process. So just quick review again, discovered in where? Best place to discover bacterial viruses? Sewage, exactly. Structures and IST equals one particle. Talked a lot about translation and replication. Again, all of this has to do with your RNA structure. And then just really briefly um, in terms of biotechnology. So there any questions about the single-stranded RNA phage? Now we'll talk about single-stranded DNA phage. And again, we're going to do basically exactly the same thing. Talk about where they came from, how it's being used as a tool. Really critical for the single-stranded DNA bacteriophage is how you make more of them. Because single-stranded DNA is really weird. You know, why on Earth or off Earth would you want to have single-stranded DNA as your genome? Because you have to make double-stranded DNA before you can do anything because all of the cellular machinery is going to be based on the messenger RNA, 
And to get your messenger RNA, first you have to do double-stranded DNA and then get your messenger RNA back out of it. So it's a really baroque mechanism. But it turns out that these single-stranded DNA phage are extremely successful. You find them all over the place, not just in bacteria, but also in eukaryotic systems. And again, a lot of those dots that I showed very early on in the first lecture that you find in oceans are actually due to these single-stranded um, bacteria phage. So we'll talk a little bit also about the assembly process because it's extremely well known for these single-stranded DNA phage, and then a little bit about diversity at the end here, which is really sort of scraping the surface here. Okay, talk a little bit about our big picture things. Again, single-stranded DNA phage, that's basically what we're going to be talking about. But the key here is really the replication. So you have to go from single-stranded to double-stranded, which is also known as the replicating form, the double-stranded form. And then the whole concept of rolling circle replication, which hopefully you've talked about in some other class before. Um, and then in terms of assembly, we have, we've mentioned scaffolding proteins a little bit before. The particular single-stranded DNA bacteriophage, Phyx-174, is really the paradigm for understanding how scaffolding, which are proteins that are involved in assembly but you actually don't have in the final virion, are important. And then also the concept of a, of a procapsid. So let's look at Phyx-174. This is the classic single-stranded DNA virus. Uh, the figure up here in the corner uh, sort of shows a little bit what that structure is supposed to look like. Um, in theory, a nice circular single-stranded uh, DNA. Anytime you see like a circle or a nice stretched out line of you know, your single-stranded RNA or single-stranded DNA, you know it's a croc because all of these things bind to each other. Um, one really fascinating aspect about Phyx-174 is that we talked about op op overlapping open reading frames last time for the small ba RNA bacteriophage. Phyx-174 is sort of the king of overlapping open reading frames. It uses all three open reading frames in its single-stranded genome, which is really pretty amazing. Uh, again, we'll talk about the replication, structural assembly, and then the diversity actually in these microviruses is relatively small, but in single-stranded DNA viruses is pretty large. So if you think about the microviruses in general, so microviruses means small virus, and all of these are single-stranded DNA viruses. The classic, again, here is Phyx-174, originally found in E. coli. But in the meantime, um, people have also found a lot of these single-stranded DNA viruses, curiously enough, infecting lots of obligate intracellular parasites. So it's an obligate intracellular replicator, because I'm not going to call it a parasite, um, infecting an obligate intracellular um, bacterium as well. So it's sort of this whole Russian doll effect. Um, and so people thought that you know, these microviruses that are infecting the free-living bacteria are sort of the main ones which are out there, and then these guys were much less so. But it turns out that there are more and more of the viruses which are actually present in the environment that seem to be similar to these kinds of viruses. Um, the other ones, which are also called the Gokusho viruses. But mostly we'll talk about Phyx-174, because again, it was the first discovered and probably best studied of any of these. Um, 5,386 bases. I don't expect you to remember that, but it's on the order of 5,000. Um, Single-stranded DNA genome, the very first ever complete genome sequence. Sequenced in 1977 by Fred Sanger, who unfortunately passed away this year. Um, one of the, I think the only person to get two um, Nobel Prizes in chemistry, um, but for sequencing this. A lot of this work was done by a fellow by the name of Robert Sinsheimer. Um, why do we care? Um, because that building up there in the corner is actually the Sinsheimer Labs at UC Santa Cruz. So you, know, you can be a scientist and even get buildings named after you um, for working on viruses. So I'm hoping, you know, eventually, <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, the viral DNA uh, was actually shown to be infectious well before they had the sequence, um, and in fact was the first synthetic genome that was ever made, in fact, at the same time as the sequence was determined. So this was you know, way early days, and in fact, some of the very first experiments with DNA polymerase used 
this single-stranded DNA genome as their template. And so if you think about what you need for DNA polymerases, single-stranded DNA template is one of the really important things you have to have. You also have to have primers. The primers are a different story. But this really nice, very consistent, always exactly the same, you can get lots of it, single-stranded DNA, was what Roger Kornberg used, and sorry, Arthur Kornberg, Roger's dad, um, used to basically determine all of the DNA polymerases, DNA polymerase 1, DNA polymerase, polymerase 2, DNA polymerase 3. Um, for that, he got then the Nobel Prize for looking at all of these polymerases. Uh, then, more recently, um, this was made completely synthetically. So just a DNA synthesizer made this in a chemical fashion in 2003. So it's been a really wonderful tool for thinking about very basic DNA molecular biology. How does these function? And we'll talk about each of these individual steps as we move along here. This is a figure from a different text, but I think it's nice to have multiple copies here. So you come in, the outside, 5X174 at the top. It's a small icosahedral capsid. We'll look at that in just a second. The positive strand is released on the inside of the cell. And again, the very first thing that has to happen is you need to make double-stranded DNA. From that double-stranded DNA, you can make more double-stranded DNA to start with, and then single-stranded DNA. This is your genome. You also have cellular transcription that makes messenger RNAs, which get translated into proteins, which will then assemble the whole particles. So what does this genome actually look like? And this was uh, one of the real surprises when they sequenced it. In fact, some people thought it was an extraterrestrial genome because it was so complex and complicated. If you look at the very top of the figure here, you'll notice um, right where that K is that these are three different proteins that are being made from one particular DNA, each of them overlapping with each other. So at that position, you've got the A protein, the A star protein, and the K protein, all of which are being made from this single piece of DNA, which is really pretty amazing. You know, all three open reading frames being used at the same time. Now, why don't we normally use all three open reading frames at the same time? What's the big danger if you, why not have an overlapping genetic code? Mutation. Mutation, exactly. So if you have a mutation, a change of one nucleotide is going to change three different protein sequences. And so it turns out, not surprisingly, that a lot of these proteins are not essential for virus function, or they're really mutation tolerant. Turns out that A star and K, you can get rid of completely the virus functions. Why they're there, why they're conserved, kind of anybody's guess. Um, the B protein is probably one of the most mutation tolerant proteins that anybody's really looked at. Um, turns out you can make, almost, I think it's up to about 30% changes in the protein sequence, and it's still functional, uh, which is really pretty amazing. Um, the E protein, which is another one of these overlapping open rating frames, is also not essential. What's interesting, if you look at the genome, you notice that the top part has all these overlapping open rating frames in it. The bottom part, however, doesn't. And the bottom part encodes for all of the structural proteins. And so those are the things that fit together to actually make the virion. So what does this tell you immediately? Structural proteins are not going to accept lots of different mutations, whereas the non-structural proteins often can. So that's just immediately looking at this genome, it tells you that. Uh, second thing, which of course is always going to be a question, whenever you've got a single genome, you're going to need a lot more of your structural proteins than you need of your non-structural proteins. How do you go about doing that? In the case of Phi-X174, it's almost all about transcriptional regulation. So it turns out that there's some really, really good promoters. So you get the RNA polymerase that binds to a promoter right here, just upstream of the B gene, and a promoter right here, just upstream of the D gene. Oh, but wait a minute. 
B genes, D genes, but I just told you these guys are disruptor genes. Why do you need so many of these guys? Well, we'll see in just a second. Turns out those are the scaffolding proteins that you need to make the whole virus particle. But it's you know, transcription, which is really regulating the amounts here. So it's not the translation as we had in the RNA um, phage, it's transcription, which is regulating these things. So let's look again at some of these microviruses. This is a cryo-EM reconstruction of one of the non phi x174. It's actually the only one. It's SP1. It's one of these parasite of parasites. So infects the spiroplasma, which is a obligate intracellular bacteria. Can replicate there. Um, up in the corner is the phi x174 structure that we'll look at um, in a little bit more detail. These all have relatively small virions. It's actually slightly larger than those single-stranded RNA phage. And again, these are circular, double strand, oh, sorry, single-stranded DNA genomes, varying in size from 4.4 to 6.1 kbs. They're relatively small, which again makes sense because the capsids are really pretty small. And so that is a possible reason that you've got these single-stranded DNAs. Is you just can package them a little bit better. Um, and this, of course, you know, I did mention that those viruses from outer space. Um, but this is from the New York Times, um, an article where you know, scientists are examining these tiny viruses for messages from outer space. Um, and so two Japanese scientists have suggested that part of the genetic sequence is a message encapsulated in virus particles to survive prolonged space journeys. Which, okay, at first, it's like, okay, this is a totally bizarre idea. No. What are these people thinking about? But if I'm, you try and think about it from the, the alien intelligence point of view, uh, one, this thing you know, looks so amazing that you know, who would have these you know, overlapping open reading frames is one thing. But also, it's a great message because it replicates itself as soon as it infects, and it makes many, many copies of itself. Now, immediately you have to have the right host. But, and these guys have eventually said you know, that we're not going to get this. You know, a phage like Phi X174 will be one of the first deciphered because it's one of the simplest. Um, and I've got a copy of this article on, on, on D2L. So it's really quite interesting, the logic that goes behind it. Most people don't believe it anymore, but um, it's really interesting logic, I think, in terms of thinking about things. So what is this message from outer space? All these different proteins here. Um, the underlines here are the ones which I think are important. Again, thinking about a week from Monday, which things do I expect you to remember? Um, so the A protein is the really critical one for DNA replication. We'll see how that works in just a second. It's not a polymerase by itself. It's really basically an endonuclease ligase. Um, so what it does is it cuts the positive strand viral DNA and initiates replication. Once you've gotten around the genome, it reverses that activity and re-ligates. So it's cutting, re-ligating, cutting, re-ligating. That's what the A protein does. The B protein, again, huge amounts of expression, but not an actual structural protein. This is an internal scaffolding protein. So it's a scaffolding protein that helps put that structure together. The D protein is also a scaffolding protein. Um, you've got many copies of these in the procapsid that we'll talk about um, a little bit more later on. What does the final structure actually look like? This is phi x174. It's a T equals 1 structure. The main protein which puts together that T equals 1 structure is the F protein. There's 60 copies of it in the final virion. So again, gives you a really good idea that's what's going on here. However, this is not your standard regular icosahedra. You'll notice there are all these bumps on the outside. Turns out these bumps are actually a separate protein. These are the G protein, which is the so-called spike protein. And all of these come together, but there are five of them. Again, at the five-fold axis of symmetry, icosahedral, you've got 12, so you've got 60 of those as well. Um, and then you also have a DNA binding protein, which is on the inside. And it turns out that there are 60 copies of that as well. Um, and it binds specifically, basically, underneath the five-fold axis of symmetry. The last structural protein that you find is the pilot protein. And it seems that the pilot protein, its job is to bind to the RNA once you have an association of the 
virion with its receptor and get that genome into the cell. Now, it turns out there's some, and unfortunately I didn't have a chance to put this into my um, lecture, I think it was about a month ago, um, published in Nature, there's a really cool change in structure that happens when these guys do their infection process. As um, one of my colleagues, in fact, who works on this virus and wrote this chapter here, says it's really kind of obscene because it looks rather phallic, as he says, the whole conformational change process that happens there. Um, but we don't have that, you know, maybe we're the family class, um, so we're not going to have that today. Uh, <clears throat> so what causes that particular change um, is receptor binding, and the receptor binding for these FIX174 microviruses is this lipopolysaccharide. So it's a very general extracellular surface protein that tells you that the determinants for tropism are probably not going to be just the receptor. They talked about FIX174 just goes into E. coli. And it turns out that the reason for that actually has to do with the transcription. So all of those promoter sequences are really good in E. coli, but they're not terribly good in other organisms. So that's where you're getting your specificity from. So glucose, LPS, present in all kinds of different bacterial cells. Once you have this binding, then you have this big conformational change, um, and then the DNA comes out through those spikes, um, and the host range is really determined through G, and then really that pilot protein, the H protein, that's pulling that DNA on the inside of the cell. Once you've pulled that single-stranded DNA inside the cell, what do you need to do? You need to make double-stranded DNA. How do you do that? Well, turns out that it's not just single-stranded, and again, you see the nice you know, diagrams that have just a single-stranded piece of DNA in there. All of these single-stranded DNA viruses, and again, true for all these RNA viruses as well, have some secondary structure in them. And in the case of FIX174, it's a hairpin structure where you have now double-stranded DNA, which is formed. Well, it turns out that that double-stranded DNA sequence is a great binding site for DNA primase. So the cellular DNA primase comes in, binds to actually that double-stranded sequence rather than the single-stranded sequence right here with brown next to it, and then gives you a nice RNA primer. That RNA primer is extended by the cellular polymerase around the genome, and you end up with double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA is great because now it's got your gangbuster promoter for the B protein, gangbuster promoter for the D protein, and you can make lots of your structural proteins and a small amount of the A protein. So let's look again at the transcription here. Again, strongest promoters are from B and from the D protein, giving you massive amounts of D. Um, I don't know if you remember, but when I talked about the, that table we had at the beginning, 160 copies of the D protein that you need, so you need the most of the D protein. So we have transcripts which are going to be coding for both of these. Um, turns out that the E protein overlapping there, you get a lot less of, and the reason for that is not translated very well. It's really not a very good DNA binding, I'll say ribosome binding site. And also E and then the H protein, remember the H protein is just one copy of it per cell. Um, these guys have rare codons in their sequence. And so rare codons are just the codons that are going to code for XYZ amino acid that you have very few tRNAs for inside the cell. And so there is presumably selection for using these non-optimal codons, so you end up with way more of the D, J, F, and G proteins than H or E. The A transcript um, is a really unstable transcript. It's the replicase, again, basically the non-structural protein that you don't need that much of, and it's you know, A, not a terribly good promoter, and B, the transcript is relatively unstable, so you don't have very much of this particular A protein. Um, but you still need that to get your replication of the single-stranded DNA, which of course is what the genome is that's actually going to be being made. How does that work? So we've got our double-stranded, also known as the replicative form of your DNA. That then gets cut by the A protein. And in fact, there at the top on the right-hand side here, it shows that you've got 
um, a big gap, it's just a single nucleotide where it gets cut. So it cuts the phosphodiester backbone. That cutting of the phosphodiester backbone is actually not so much an endonuclease cleavage. It's much more like a topoisomerase. And many of these topoisomerases have tyrosines. What's the really cool thing about tyrosine residues? What have they got at the, on, the end sticking out? They got OHs. So the OH at the end of the tyrosine basically acts like the OH that you would have on your deoxynucleoribose. So uh, here, that basically binds to, and what you uh, hopefully, you can't see it here terribly well, the dark gray circle up at the top there is supposed to represent the A protein. So that A protein with its tyrosine is now hooked up to the five prime phosphate. You just made that nick in the DNA. Then you have the DNA polymerase together with a cellular helicase, which basically peels off this single strand. And your normal DNA polymerase 3 will extend. And so this extension process, the helicase pulls that strand off. Once it gets all the way back up to the top here, that A protein, which had bound its tyrosine to the 5' prime end, now reverses that activity. And now you have the 3' prime OH attached to the 5' prime phosphate that was there before. You release these single strands, and they either go off and get packaged into virus particles, or you've also got this nice you know, primosome binding site, so you can make more double-stranded form. It turns out you need about 10 copies of the positive strand before the A protein is made. Again, this unstable transcript, you have enough of the A protein to start going through this whole process. So, and basically, is, you know, hopefully is, is pretty obvious here, this can just go around again and again and again and again. And so that's the rolling circle process of rolling circle replication. And we'll see this happens for quite a few of the different bacteriophage as we move through here. So rolling circle, it's a ligation, endonuclease, reversible activity. And again, I like to think of this much more like a topoisomerase than I do um, thinking about it as an endonuclease. So, um, and I think this also has to do with really cool RNA-DNA hybrid viruses, but we'll talk about those um, later on in the class. <clears throat> so once you've made this genome, you need to put it into something. And this is where um, the work of Ben Fain really comes into this process, because he has really done an amazing job, as far as I'm concerned, at understanding how these whole particles get put together. We already mentioned our internal and external scaffolds. The B, oh, actually, should have and D proteins, sorry about that, um, have very flexible structures, and also these are the ones that can have this really huge variation in their sequence. Again, because they're these overlapping open rating frames. They're incredibly uh, <clears throat> mutation tolerant. The process happens here. You have the internal scaffolding protein together with the main capsid protein, which is the F protein. These guys come together to form these panomeric structures, you also have the G protein, which is that spike protein. These then stack on top of each other. Together with the B protein, this now gives a particle which is really pretty stable. Just the sizes here are just the relative sedimentation coefficients. You can isolate each of these guys. If you don't have the B protein around, you basically just end up with these. You add the B protein, you'll get these particles. These Panamers, however, are never going to come together to make a full icosahedral particle in the absence of the D protein, which now allows these 12 panamers to come together to make this structure. Now, what's really interesting about this structure, hopefully, it should be obvious, that this is not the same as the structure that I showed you before. This is the so-called procapsid because it's preceding the actual capsid form. One of the things that hopefully you also notice on here is the lack of any DNA anywhere. So this is actually made completely 
in the absence of any of the DNA whatsoever. So you make these capsids. Again, you have large amounts of the B protein, a lot of the D protein, F and <clears throat> G proteins. Those all come together to make the procapsid. That procapsid, this is basically that process right here, now needs to get DNA put into it. Now, it turns out the DNA, as it's getting put in, takes this single-stranded DNA and apparently puts it through the threefold axis of symmetry, packs it inside this procapsid structure, which has a bunch of B protein in it. And so as this single-stranded DNA comes in, the B protein comes out. Once you have the whole genome, which has been put inside, and probably it's just a space constraint. Once you fill up everything that's on the inside, then you have the D protein that comes off, giving you your final infectious virion structure. And one of the neat things about this is that you go from the procapsid, which here is a much bigger structure, to the final virion on the right-hand side there. Um, and that's another again, really nice example of this whole capsid paradox. You have to have something that you can assemble, that you can put together, that eventually is going to release your capsid, but on the outside of the cell, it's got to be really stable. And so it turns out that you need to have these procapsid structures, which are more open, so that you can put your DNA in here and get the B protein back out. Once you have the conformational change, there's no hole left in this structure. And so now it's a much more stable structure that can now be used to go and get outside the cell. Yeah? So does the DNA cause the conformational change that reduces the B protein? Yeah, so it seems to be when you've completed the packaging, so completed putting in that genome, that stimulates the conformational change which leads to the dissociation of D. The dissociation of D then gives you this compact virion structure. Yeah? In the DNA packing complex, mm -hmm. does the DNA get inside just by affinity alone or are there proteins helping push the DNA into the structure? Yeah, so if you remember that J protein, the DNA binding protein, that actually, let's back up a slide. That's together here. So these little red icons here are supposed to represent the J protein, okay. which is being packaged on the inside together with the DNA. Okay. And then the B protein just leaves. It, right. It's not shoved out. It just leaves by. Well, it's not clear whether it's being shoved out or it's leaving okay. in that process. Um, there's no specific enzymatic activity, which is moving it out. We'll see that for packaging of some bacteriophage, there actually is enzymatic activity that's required. In this case, it just seems to be the replication process, just displacement. And so probably what happens is J plus DNA is actually better at binding to the inside of the structure than B is. Yeah. And so this is that competition okay. just going on there. Okay, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. what is, what does that mean? Okay, so these are just the sedimentation coefficients. And so back in the day when people actually did ultracentrifugation, um, you would use um, sedimentation coefficients just to separate. So if you think about 30S um, ribosomes, 50S ribosomes, that's all the Svedberg, which is the relative sedimentation that you have. So it's just a way of looking at how big these pieces are relative to each other. So that's all that those S's stand for. And I wouldn't you know. Wait, What's in the 12S complex? Uh, I can't remember what's in the 12S complex of Phi X174, so I wouldn't expect you to know that. Yeah? So at the bottom it says it contains proteins A and C. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the C part of it? Uh, okay, so <laughs> the C part. Um, so um, C is another one of these proteins. I don't know if I got the genome here. Uh, sorry for backing up um, like this, but um, there's this you know, C protein here overlapping on the last non-structural proteins that we talked about. Uh, that protein uh, 
Once you've undergone this whole rolling circle replication, that basically serves as the target. Once we've done this process, you get to the end here, the C protein will bind to this structure and bring it to the capsid proteins. So that will then, in that process, seems to be getting you to the displacement, you know, together with J. Yeah? You also mentioned that the, uh, the D protein was internal? Uh, so D protein is external. Maybe I misspoke on that. So B is internal, D is external. And if you, if you think about it, it you can, that kind of makes sense because if you think about what's present on the inside, that's going to be the B protein. There's going to be a lot less space on the inside as opposed to the D protein on the outside. Uh, one of the things that you, again, may or may not remember, how many copies of the D protein did we say we had? Yeah. So... In fact, it's forming on the outside here a basically T equals 3 symmetrical structure. So it's 180 um, that you have on the outside that then is binding there. Okay, so we put everything together. How do we get out? It's the E protein. The E protein functions a lot like penicillin. And what does penicillin do? No, penicillin doesn't block translation. It's one of the few antibiotics that doesn't block translation. It inhibits cell wall growth. It inhibits the cell wall growth and literally the cross-linking of the peptidoglycan. And so basically what this means is, is that you only are going to release the virus when you're actively growing. And that makes perfect sense from the virus's point of view. If the cell you've infected is actively growing, there probably are some other cells around that are ready to be infected and also actively growing. And so that process uh, makes sense again, so it's the E protein and just serves to block that um, transpeptidation, which happens there. Finish up in the last couple of minutes, wanted to talk about um, the synthetic virus. Um, this was a paper, again, published in 2003. These are the plaques. They should look really familiar because they're very similar to the plaques that I brought in to class the other day. Um, this is classic FIAX-174, and they make a huge big deal about this because they made it with their DNA synthesizer in 2003, but Roger Kornberg used DNA polymerase in 1977. So, but yes, you can make synthetic DNA, and it will make a functional virus genome. So, that's one aspect of these, you know, FIAX 174s. The last thing I wanted to talk about gets back to what I talked about right at the beginning, which is the real diversity of these microvirus sequences. And that brings us to my favorite field site. It's a place called Boiling Springs Lake, Lassen Volcanic National Park. Uh, this lake is probably the biggest hot spring in the world that nobody's ever heard of. Um, it's about 100 meters by 200 meters. The low temperature is 50 degrees Celsius. The pH is 2.3. None of my students wanted to swim out in the lake and collect samples, so we got the mechanical engineers as part of their capstone project to build this little ROV that runs out on the lake. The um, Jolly Roger here that some of you may be able to see was actually their idea, uh, but the, uh, anybody who's played video games just love this thing because you got to drive the, the ROV across the lake. Uh, one of the things that we were doing with this is trying to you know, get an idea out in the middle of the lake whether it really was 50 degrees, we could just measure around the outside. And so we were able to show that basically the whole lake is this temperature, other than the very far south end of the lake where the temperatures get really hot. Um, maybe it's you know, kind of hard to see in this picture, but there are a couple of people down here who are some of the botanists from the PSU biology department. In fact, I think that one's Dr. Rosenstiel for any of you who are in cell biology right now. <laughs> So they're interested in the mosses which are there. Um, the reason, however, that I show you this is because we have discovered some microvirus sequences in this really extreme environment. And so that discovery process, we did all kinds of virus metagenomics that I'll talk about in my talk that I'll plug for next Tuesday. Um, but basically, we got some sequences in there that were clearly microvirus-like sequences. So those are the two up at the top here, um, BSL for Boiling Springs Lake. Two different, actually we've got three now complete genomes of these microviruses from Boiling Springs Lake. 
And it turns out that they are very different from all of the other microviruses, and particularly the microviruses which infect these obligate intercellular parasites. So chlamydia, again, obligate intercellular bacteria, um, spiroplasma, some other chlamydial phages. And so these guys are infecting those intracellular parasites, but there are no obvious intracellular parasites at 50 degrees C and pH of 2. So I think it's a nice example of probably a lot of the viruses infecting free living organisms that happen to be in these environments. And in fact, we're not the only people who have done metagenome sequencing to have found sequences that are similar to these guys, but still really quite divergent in terms of thinking about the actual um, sequence and process which is there. Now, why do you find these single-stranded DNA viruses all over the place? Um, because they have to go through this you know, whole really baroque cycle to go through the process. Well, it turns out it's not just in bacteria. Gemini viruses, which infect plants, have exactly the same process. We'll talk more about some of the circo and parvoviruses in animals, replicate in an extremely similar way, also single-stranded DNA viruses. Um, they're all icosahedral. Almost all of them have T equals one capsids, except for the Gemini viruses, which are really interesting. They've got two capsids kind of you know, bound to each other. That's why they're called Gemini viruses. Um, structural similar replication mechanisms. So why? Um, I think it's because they can steal RNA, but we'll talk about that when we talk about these circoviruses a little bit later on. Have a good weekend.